Perfect. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for joining LMA Canada for today's voice search webinar. My name is Caitlin Cook Mackey and I'm a marketing and business development specialist at Saskin. I would like to take a moment to thank our voice search webinar sponsor, Key Media. Thank you. Uh, this webinar, as I mentioned, is being recorded and the link will be shared following this session. We have time towards the end for Q&A, so please enter your questions in the chat box as we go. No need to wait until the very end. And we'll get through as many as we can in the time allowed. It is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Morgan McLeod, CEO of Cubicle Fugitive and LMA Canada's president. Morgan, over to you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. So I'm very excited. We have a really great panel uh, today. We have some great uh, panelists. First is Jacob Releader. He is the senior manager of digital at Key Media. So they cover the brands such as Canadian Lawyer Magazine and Lexpert. Jacob has worked in SEO and content marketing for the past nine years. He believes that educating stakeholders and getting insights from all team members is the key to a successful digital marketing strategy. He has helped both large and small companies rank higher in Google search results and guided these businesses to create content that builds trust and converts visits to leads. We're really excited to have you, Jacob. Thanks, great to be here. We also have Ted Lau. Ted is the CEO of Ballistic Arts. He's the owner and CEO and is founded in 2002. Ballistic Arts is an award-winning lead generation digital marketing agency that focuses on online lead generation and brand awareness for Canada's best known brands, professional services, B2B businesses, and membership-based associations. Ballistic Arts has a full divisions in lead generation, digital marketing, graphic design, video production, and web development. Ted, we're really excited to have you join us today too. Thank you, nice to be here. All right, so voice search is a, is a big area. People are talking all about it. There's lots of questions. So we're gonna start off with, with covering some of the basics. So Ted, can you talk to us a little bit about, talk to our audience about what is voice search and, and really how does it differ from type search? Yeah, absolutely. So um, maybe what I'll start, and thank you everybody, welcome everybody. Um, and so what I'll, I'll start off with is that like, I think while the term voice search might be uh, something that's a little bit you know, new and scary, I think we really got to think about it like the next evolution of tech search. Uh, basically, um, we're very lazy as human beings. And so if you can talk to a machine as opposed to type it, I think it, it, it's really the, the next evolution. Now I did prepare some slides. I don't know sure. if this is the time, Morgan, for me to, yeah, this to be great. present it. Um, let me just share my screen here. And just to kind of kick off and give, Give everyone here, the audience, a little bit of understanding of what uh, what this is about. Can we see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, basically, voice search is this little this little thing on the on the right here on a search bar. You'll see it these days. You can also just if you have Alexa at home or Siri at home, uh, you can simply notify it or in your car. Uh, a lot of car people have uh, Apple CarPlay and whatnot, and you can use that to do voice search. Now, voice search has actually been something that's been around um, since you know last last decade. Um, in 2013, uh, quoted uh, the head of Google's um, search ranking team, they said that the destiny of Google search engine is to become the Star Trek computer, and that's what they're they're really building. So it's you know if, if any of you are Trekkie fans, um, you know you say, Picard says something to the computer, and then it it does something back to you. And so how it works is they use something called semantic search. Uh, and oh, by the way, I can certainly have um, Caitlin send this deck later and share it with everybody so you don't, don't have to frantically um, write this down or, or do screen, screen caps. Um, semantic search seeks to improve search accuracy by understanding the searcher's intent, basically, right? And the contextual meanings behind the terms. It's not great, but it is the way that like you're just searching something, but it'll actually like elaborate on the next thing that or the, the from the previous thing that you, you've searched. So uh, I did an example and I did the screen shares here. Um, I'm in here in, in uh, Vancouver. I'm actually in the suburbs of Vancouver uh, in Coquitlam. And uh, I just did a little voice search said, you know, give me the best um, insurance law firms, right? And I, I did it like I said it, like if, as if it was Jarvis from, uh, from the Marvel uh, movies. And so this is what it spit up. And locally right close to me is a, a place called Drysdale Bacon. And um, the next thing I asked was, well, who's the partner at Drasdell Bacon? And it shows up, you know, Chris Bacon, and then here's his LinkedIn profile. And then after that, I said, okay, well then give me the phone number. And here's the phone number. And then I asked, well, okay, well, if I, maybe I made the call now, give me the directions. 
And so this all came through me not typing, but actually speaking to uh, the computer. And this is that while, while that's just Google, voice search happens with Siri as well. So I did the same thing, right? Vancouver top uh, law firms, top insurance law firms. And so this came up this time and the rankings on Yelp is what was um, shown for, uh, because you know they don't do Google reviews because it's Apple. And then again, directions. So similar thing, and if you're in your car, this is how you would you could you could do that. Uh, some stats. I won't go through all of them, but needless to say, that um, the voice search usage and adoption is happening. And while some of these are B two B numbers, a lot of this is also B uh, sorry B two C numbers. A lot of them are also B two B numbers. Um, and if you think about it, the efficiency is really really important. And I have links. All of these have actual links to the the articles that I found. Think about it. You can type 38 to 40 words per minute, maybe on a mobile device, but you can speak to it at least 150 words a minute. So it's much quicker. And we're walking around with our devices all the time. Really easy to do. There's another article here. Um, it's, you know, almost two years old, but it says, you know, why think, you know, things that law firms need to know about voice search, things that you really need to do. It's really similar when like tech search, like you do things like adding your business name, your address, phone number, all the stuff that you would do for my your, for Google My Business, this is all that you would you do. Things that you would want to add that a lot of people don't do is awards that they've won um, and attorneys that they, they have at their firm, make it so that it's searchable. And then, you know, again, how is this relevant? Basically, the four key things you want to take away is that it makes information more convenient and accessible. It reduces exertion and increase productivity because you can do stuff and talk at the same time. And it'll help and include people who require speed and um, sight assist, speech and sight assistance. So that's basically it. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Jacob, anything you, you wanna add to that about sort of your experience with, with voice search or things that we should know about? Sure. Um, to be honest, I think Ted, you did a fantastic job. I think you covered all the bases. Um, I think the only thing I would really add is that as you can see from some of those examples, voice search at the moment, although I do think it is evolving, uh, tends to be about really direct answers to questions. So really simple, they call it featured snippets on Google, like just straightforward answers, like where's my business? Uh, I'm sorry, where is a business? How do I get there? Those types of questions. So when you're writing content that's good for voice search, just remember that it's really direct, simple answers is what voice search tends to be used for right now. Whereas when people used to look at type search, um, a lot of the old best practices are long form articles with subheadings and lots of information about a topic because people really want to delve into it, which is still the case with a lot of type search queries. Uh, but voice search is really to the point simple answers. And I think it's good that law firms know um, you need to make sure that information is easily accessible by Google and by potential clients, because that's what's going to happen uh, in those voice searches. Um, and to Ted's point, you know, some companies, they don't have a really easy way to get their address. And if they don't have a really easy way to get their address, then a voice search to find your address is just not going to work. Um, so I think that's the only thing I'd add to that, really. Okay. And so, too, when, when people are thinking about it from a law firm, we've had you covered some of the, the things of, you know, on our phones, we have our Google Homes, all that sort of stuff, too. So thinking about, I mean, we have a Google Home, so we're asking random questions all the time, whether it's, you know, what's the weather like, what's happening in the news, but people are asking those questions, so more than just about locations and stuff, but we're asking questions and, and look, hoping for answers so, so that they should think about that. So would you say it's... I guess, Ted, how would you say is, is voice search the new normal? How, how widely is it used these days? Uh, that's a great question. I think like everything in, in marketing and, and digital, usually um, the, the, the early adopters are the businesses that are business to consumer because consumers are, like you said, they're cooking at home, they're at, trying to find product and you know show me the latest video on how to cook this vegan recipe or something like that. That is usually the B to C, but B to B these days is especially, you know, in the age of, well, we're doing Zoom calls and everything because of the pandemic digitization is being pulled forward. It's not far behind. So I really consider um, some of the long form content that you might have. If you have articles that are really relevant to your, your um, prospective clients, I would actually make sure that those are really easily found because people can then ask those inquiries about like, you know, what are the top five things I need to worry about 
when it comes to aviation law or something like that. An article will show up. And, you know, I, I don't know if you've seen those commercials where someone's cooking and their hands are dirty or whatnot, and they got their little iPad or their TV in front of them. They can actually pull that up now um, much easier. And I don't know about you. I, I, I'm a bit of a multitasker. It's COVID. I'm working all the time. So, yes, I'm cooking meals, but I'm also like checking on things at the same time. So uh, that would be some some things that you might want to consider. And, and Jacob, you kind of brought it up a few minutes ago of that sort of short, you know, when we're asking Google or asking, you know, Siri questions and we want that short answer. And then Todd talked about too, those, the need for long form content meet short form. I don't know if either one of you can kind of touch on that too, of how that works together with uh, voice activated search. Yeah, I guess in my opinion, um, and then Ted, really interested in your thoughts too. Uh, to be honest, there's now two completely separate content streams on how people get to your website. There's probably a lot more, but I like to look at it as two buckets. Uh, one bucket is those really simple, quick answers that are not necessarily going to bring in clients or potential leads, but they are going to bring in a lot of people and build your brand awareness. Um, so I do think when you look at your content structure, you have to think about what are some simple questions that my clients want to know one about my business for sure, and then two about the services that I offer. Um, so how to find my business, that's a big one. But then maybe, um, you know, what should I look for in a family lawyer? Or what are the top 10 family lawyers around me? Uh, not that you'd want to promote the competition, but just an idea of simple stuff that you can get out there. And then there are the longer form content streams. So these are people who really want to delve into an issue. They want to understand your business better. Um, and they really want to know everything about the services you offer. And you really have to think about how those work together. Whereas the short form answers um, can really get some people onto that long form content and can kind of guide traffic onto those longer form pieces. And the longer form pieces can help people who are really into the research make the final decision. Um, so really, I think it's about understanding that there's the quick information and then there's in-depth information. And are you serving both of those uh, groups? Yeah, and, and to add to that, actually, um, how I like to, to advise my clients um, is, is create something is, that's called bingeable content. And so this is actually something that I heard through, um, I host a, a, a national podcast called Marketing News Canada. Uh, you guys can check it out on, on all the podcast channels. And one of the guests um, had told me that, you know, the secret these days is creating bingeable content. And if you think about it, we like to binge content now, right? Netflix, you watch an entire thing of Squid, Squid Games. I haven't watched Squid Games, but like, you know what I'm talking about. That's the latest one that I'm talking about right now. Ted Lasso, there, you binge all the Ted Lasso stuff, right? And so I actually hate the fact that I have to wait every Friday for Ted Lasso's new episode to come out. I'd rather watch the whole thing at the same time. And that's how you want to actually think about your content. Now, when you do that though, when you have lots of different content, you're able to repurpose that. So if you think about creating a, a piece of long form content, maybe it's top 10 things that you need to think about for, for law in the next, you know, 2022. I don't know, I'm just making that up. But you can make one big long article with 10 subheaders that are easy for people to read. You can then make those little, you know, 10 subheaders into actual little social ads, into little videos. And that way you can repurpose it for many different channels. So then you can have this one piece that then can be, you know, quote unquote, bingeable. You can even do like a 10 part series if you're really inclined to it. And then you can chop them up into little short form pieces uh, to what Jacob is saying. And you kind of get, you know, two birds with one stone as it were. That's a great point. I think, I think a lot of times firms get overwhelmed by the thought of, you know, content that they have to produce. And it really is, can you take a subject matter and break it down into finer points and expand upon them? And it doesn't have to be um, like a scholarly legal article like they may have thought in the past. It's really about sort of how do we answer as many questions as possible. Yeah, snackable have, content, like Susan I, just said. On the I chat. like that. Yeah, exactly. Snackable. <laughs> it's important of snackable, I think, for the user and then, you know, deep content for, for search too of, yeah. of mm -hmm. being a validated source. So do you guys have a sense of who is using voice search and how it's being used today? And especially when you're thinking about, I know we've got people on here, both, you know, B2B and B2C law firms. So thinking about that, do you guys have a sense of, of who's using it and how? Well, back to the slide that I had earlier, I'm just kind of reading it again. It said something like 71% of people would rather utilize voice search than a keyboard. And then 53% of consumers are already using voice search. I do think that it's still predominantly B2C 
today. So if you are, you know, I know PI is not as big anymore, but if you're into that as, as your, your, your specialty in law, or maybe you're an employee employment lawyer, yeah, these are right. Family law. These are, you're definitely going to want, want to use that now. Now, if you're more specialized, like I said, maybe aviation law or, I don't know, some, some obscure mergers and acquisitions. Or, yeah. Yeah. Merger, yeah, maybe an MA, <laughs> maybe, maybe, you know, that's that's less uh, important today, but it is on the horizon. I would think in about 18 months, this is going to probably change. Like I, I follow a guy, he's uh, one of the marketing gurus in, in North America named Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V. And basically he has like a, a similar business to mine, but like, you know, a hundred times bigger. And he talked about this in his podcast gosh, I want to say six or seven years ago. And he was like, voice is the next thing, voice is the next thing, voice is the next thing. And, you know, it is, and we're talking about it here. Yeah. And I guess, Jacob, so, I mean, you guys, one of your, one of Lexford's big verticals and Kimita's big verticals is legal. So talk to us, where do you see voice search fitting in your overall SEO efforts? Where, how should we prioritize this when we're thinking about, right? SEO is a big area, you know, often, confusing and you know <laughs> mystifying the most but so where should this sit um to be honest it's becoming more and more a part of how we build our content um not necessarily because it's tailored for voice search but because what we're really looking at is how people actually search for content in general and more and more uh, looking at semantically related searches as ted was saying before what Google's trying to do is try to understand better how people naturally talk and to understand people better how people naturally search. So Google's not really concerned with, have I typed in the exact right phrase to take me to the exact right article anymore? What it really is concerned with is what are people actually asking for and how do we present the content they actually want? So that's why now when we look at content, uh, even if we're building the long form content, what we're trying to figure out is, you know, how would people in their daily life actually ask these questions and then how can we turn those questions into content and that's why voice search is becoming a big part of it because what we're saying is well how would a person actually ask their lawyer this question and then have we answered that question and the second reason we do that is even if they're going to type the search probably they're thinking of the way that they would ask it so they probably type it differently than they would think about the question if that makes sense mm -hmm. so if we can figure out um, how they would say the question and present that as the title of the article, that's the one that's going to stand out to them, as opposed to the one that's more kind of professional and more kind of uh, legalese focused, if that makes sense. So, and I think, Ted, you were touching upon that too. So how do we optimize then for search intent, which is, I think is really what you guys are getting to. Yeah, absolutely. So, so gone are the days of, if you, if you guys recall, like I've, I've had my business almost 20 years when search engines first came out, um, you know, you almost had to, we have, we've been trained on how to use a search engine. We had to type in, you know, Montreal divorce lawyers, right? Like that's, that's how we had to type it. But you don't talk like that. If, if I was asking you, Morgan, you know, Hey, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to walk up to you and just go Montreal's best law firms. Like you're, <laughs> you're going to think I'm crazy, right? Yeah. Are you, we're going to have a, a more an, an actual conversation, conversation yeah. organic yeah. conversation. Hey, can you tell me where the, the, the best Montreal lawyers in Montreal, like that, that's really what it's going to be. And so what AI has really helped and it's, while it's scary, it, it is something that is helping humans. Um, you're able to just use your own language. You don't have to, you don't have to follow mm -hmm. the old semantics of how you had to use a search engine. You're just going to say it like you normally say it. And it's, it, it is still not great. Like sometimes I talk to Siri and I want to throw my phone away, yeah. right? Because it's like, I want you to play this song and then it, you know, shows up this video that's completely different, um, but it's, it's getting there. Yeah. Jacob, any other ways that you, you guys advise, you know, your clients on how to optimize their website or content for, for voice or for. Yeah. I mean, for content, I'm not sure if I'm speaking a little out of turn here, but one thing that we say is think about your worst client. And what that means is think about the client who has a million questions, the client who is very heavily critical of what you're doing and who needs to really be walked through the process and you really need to hold their hand 100% of the time. Think about all the questions that they might ask you and how you answer those questions for them. 
and then make sure that you have content that kind of re, um, that kind of mimics that on your website. Because essentially, if you've done that, you've already built the trust with your audience, and you've kind of really uh, hit the nail on the head to the questions that people are going to be googling anyway. So I think even though we're saying digital is the new age, you can still use those lessons that you've gotten from the in-person to build content around it. So I think that's really important. Um, and that brings me to your overall website. So one of the big things that we focus on when we advise lawyers, when we talk to lawyers, uh, is how much can people trust you when they get to your website? Because that's also something that Google's trying to get in line with. All of their algorithms are trying to look at how do people trust this website so we can recommend it because it's well trusted. And so what we tell uh, lawyers is, all right, if a client came to your website, is it easy to find out who the people are at your, at your law mm -hmm. firm and what their experience is? Is it easy to see why you're respected? So can I see the awards that you've won? Um, which is another point about voice search, what you need to do. Is it easy to find out about the services that you offer? So what are the practice areas that you focus on? And if I look at those practice areas, is there a bulk of content about how you service clients in those practice areas? Or is it a quick paragraph that says you're the best at this practice area, which isn't great. So more and more, it's about um, answering questions before people have the chance to ask on your website and making sure that you're really honest and really kind of transparent about why you are the best and why you're qualified and what the process is gonna be like as a client when I get to, you, when I um, come to your law firm. Yeah, if I could add to, yeah, to, to Jacob's points, um, it's about providing value. Gone are the days of like flashy, flashy, this is who we are mm -hmm. and just give us a call. Back to Gary Vaynerchuk's point about, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, he, he actually, uh, has a book called Jab, 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 Right Hook, which is, you know, the boxing analogy, Jab, 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 Right Hook. And what the jabs are basically the value proposition, the value that you're providing. No one's going to care about your content. Actually, quite frankly, awards are good to have, but awards are not the things that are going to really get people through to, to, you know, work with you. It's the value that you're going to give them. And I think a lot of businesses like I know I have you know, law, law clients mm -hmm. as well, where they're a little afraid. Like if I give away all my expertise, well, they're just gonna take it. No, they're not. Like <laughs> you give, give so much that they get overwhelmed by going like, wow, this person really knows what they're talking about. This firm knows their stuff, right? That bingeable content. And mm -hmm. they're gonna think, well, then I'm gonna hire them because they know that they can handle it. Like I, I myself, you know, follow, follow this um, as a consumer where, uh, there's a, I'm in Vancouver. There's a course called strategic coach out in Toronto mm -hmm. and it's a business program. And I went onto their podcast cause it was like, it was pretty expensive for myself as a, as an entrepreneur to, I'm like, do I really want to spend this money and fly there and take this course? So I went onto their podcast and I kept listening to their content and their content. Basically they gave away their course through their podcast, the entire course. And I'm sitting there like listening. I'm like, I'm not going to do this by myself. Like it's just, it's not going to happen, but the stuff made sense to me. So I paid the money and I flew across the country to take these courses and I, I did it like once a quarter for a couple of years. So um, that's the advice that I would give. The content which you're giving, like voice is great. That's the how people access your content, but your content has to be, content is still king mm -hmm. or queen or whatever we say now. <laughs> content is, is the key, right? So you need to have content that is going to be of value to the other person. Not that it's gonna be beneficial to you, What's it going to do to change them? And then they're going to think, oh, you're authentic. In the age of fake news, like you have to be authentic or else it's not going to work. And I think key to, and sorry to interject, but we were talking about, we had a, a pre-discussion too, of like thinking about those stages of their process. I think a lot of times, mm -hmm. you know, firms get lost in the, what is the initial intent, the initial question, but thinking about the stages and, and questions your clients will have throughout, you know, if they're thinking of PI, right? It's, it's, it's potentially a five-year case. And I have very different questions at the beginning when I'm searching than when I'm like, is my lawyer doing a great job and should I reevaluate this? So thinking about every stage of the process and, and developing content for each one of those two is, is critical. Yeah, we have, a, we have a client that basically in their, not in, in the, the real estate space, but they had, they're, they're actually a renovator. And they said that during this particular stage, of their business, they get all these questions, right? So we just made a bunch of content that that addressed, you know, the design phase because all these people had these, these. So there may be a point in your business, in your firm, where you know there's like, like you said, Morgan, different stages. That's mm -hmm. the content that you should should work on because again, it's it's almost like you're overwhelming them with with 
content, but it has to be valuable content. And um, inevitably, you'll end up being the, the expert in, in your field. Yeah. And then I think yeah. we touched, but yeah, go ahead, Jacob, please. No, I was just going to say, I mean, to both of your points, one thing to keep in mind about that's specific to law firms about the content you write and about that whole process is most of the time people aren't coming to you because it's it's a good time in their life. Like that's not why they're accessing this content. So I think that's another factor why it's really important to be authentic and to build that trust with the audience because you want to be there as someone that they can count on, someone they can rely on and they know the answers are there. And unfortunately for most people, their first interaction with you is going to be through Google and then through your website. So you really want to make sure that that content you have on your website acknowledges that, acknowledges that this might be a bad time for them, acknowledges that you're going to reassure them, you're going to walk them through the process and acknowledges that because it's long, they might disconnect with you or they might um, kind of lose interest in what's going on. So mm -hmm. how is your content going to bring them back in and make them feel engaged in that process if that's what you want to do? Any other sort of tips? I think you talked about sort of snack of bits and, and someone mentioned to uh, presenting sort of practical, actionable steps. I don't know if you guys want to elaborate on that, the importance of that and optimizing content. How, how they go about, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll let Jacob go on this one first. Sure. Um, so just for some practicable steps. Um, so I think one thing that we talk to uh, some of the law firms that we work with is what are some actual things that you can do on your website to make sure that one, it's trusted by Google and two, it's potentially going to be trusted by anybody who gets there. Um, the first one is actually just to kind of present your whole team. So a lot of times on the websites, people will have their about us page, which really focuses on the top people at a law firm. But it's good to have content that kind of talks about everybody on your team, from the people who are going to be answering the phones that clients are going to be dealing with, to the lawyers who do the day-to-day -day research, to the partners at the firm. So really helping people to see these are the people behind my case, and these are the people that I'm going to connect with. So that's a great place to really start. Um, the next place is you want to show your expertise and authority really clearly on your website. And so what that means is um, list the practice areas that you cover, but really get in depth about what you do differently, what you will provide your clients with, and really get into depth about if you come to us for a family law case, from the moment you walk through the door, this is what's going to happen to the moment that the case is over. And just so that people kind of get that connection with you and understand the process a little bit better. Um, make sure that it's really easy to reach out and contact you as well. So a lot of times what you want to do is look at the pages that are bringing in clients and looking at the pages that are bringing in views and making sure that from each of those pages, there's a really easy way to contact your form whether it's just a button that they can click and get some information about you, or whether it's a button that leads to a contact form. This is one thing that people often miss. Um, we see it a lot where law firms will actually have a page for each of their lawyers. And what happens is a lot of people actually search for specific lawyers by name because maybe they've read about a case they've done in the news, or they've seen an article that they've written on another site. You go to that lawyer page and there's no easy way to actually contact the firm once you've landed on that page. So make sure that all that stuff is really in place, which is really good to do. Um, and then finally, it all really comes back to content is invest in your content. Make sure you have a content plan. Make sure you've kind of laid out. These are the issues that we want to focus on because these are the issues we feel bring in clients and that we feel our clients want to know about and map it out and invest in it. And that means invest your time um, and invest in some really good writers uh, as well, because that's going to be a, a big thing for you in the future. Uh, yeah. So, so while Jacob talked about the, the small little bits, I'm going to, I'm going to take one, just a little step back and talk about um, before you do all that stuff, I always, we always do this for our clients. And when we do lead generation um, is to really understand who your buyer is. So you're building your buyer personas is super important by that. I mean, not just like, Oh, we work with, um, you know, people that get injured. That's, that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about like the specific type of um, person that you want to come through the door all the time and build a profile for them. Like, are the, what, what's their age? Is it like 45? They're married, two kids. These are the brands that they like. All those kinds of things are going to really help you, one, understand, you know, how do they think? How do they talk? How do they like to receive content? Where do they hang out? And then you can then create content that's really going to be very targeted to them. And why that's important is also while that's going to be much searchable, if you do decide afterwards to do things like 
lead generation activities, when you create those ads specifically to that persona, your ad costs are going to be way lower than your competitor. And that's a secret that we have, you know, basically having good data and good creative to then lower your ad costs. And it, you basically reach more people for the same dollars. You were kind of touching upon stuff that I uh, see you were talking about kind of working smarter, not harder too. So again, are there things that practical tips you would give them of, of repurposing content in many different formats, taking that same thing and making sure that you are either optimizing it or using different formats or different ways people digest? Do you guys want to yeah. elaborate a little bit on that? Always, always. So repurposing content is the thing I think is the, the number one key, right? Ultimately, everyone here uh, works in a law firm where um, the, the inventory are the lawyers, are their brains and, and their time, right? So whenever you're taking them away from that time, because I think a lot of the writers write the blog content because it's so the subject matter is, is so specific, yeah. you want to take that time optimally, write that long form piece, kind of like I talked about earlier, but then think about all the different channels that you're going to be at. Are you, are you thinking LinkedIn? Are you Twitter? Like, are you TikTok? I don't know if you're TikTok, but like maybe you are. And then create little videos that you're going to use. And remember when you're doing video that you got to think about like the, the vertical, like, is it vertical or is it this way? Cause like most people, if, you know, they're, they're reading it this way. Right. So you got to make sure that your, your videos are also going to be positioned in a way that is going to work for the medium. So you, like Jacob said, create your content plan, but really we've, we've done this. Like if you go back to our blog, we have like, uh, you know, the top 10 lead gen tips or, or whatever um, for 2021. And we made a two part series and then we made a bunch of videos and we made a bunch of ads and we've been, so it's, it's way easier if you just build the plan as opposed to being overwhelmed with, I got to write this content and this content and this content. No, you can just take one piece of content and repurpose it so many times. Mm -hmm. Really good point that you make too about kind of the lawyers being the main asset or content producers for all of this, because that's how you really want to show your expertise in any field. So one thing that we've actually done on Lexpert that works really well is we've kind of divided up the work to make it so that lawyers can contribute content to us without making it too difficult for them, where we actually spend the time, we get the topic, here's seven questions about the topic. Whenever you have time, just write a quick answer to the questions, then hand that off to an editor. And then what we have is something really great because actually they're gonna write a nice long answer to each question whenever they have time. Each question becomes its own mini article. We can repurpose them into one big article about a topic if they all work that way. And then that gives us ideas for videos in the future as well. It's like, wow, you spoke to this question, these questions really well. So let's do a video where we answer these 10 questions. And then like you said, Ted, parse it up into little things we can release on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever other social medium and really get the most value out of it. Um, because it's all about time, right? Lawyers, unfortunately, don't have that much time to produce content. So if you make it digestible for them to produce, that already makes it digestible for you to kind of send out to the world, which is a really great strategy um, because people don't want to sit and read a 2000 world article. That's right. just not how we do it anymore, but they are <laughs> they're free. Like yeah, <laughs> Google Google does love it. It. <laughs> they really do. Yeah, they really do. But they are going to look through an article really quickly. Yeah. They're going to see the question they want and read that. Um, actually, when I used to be an English teacher, which oddly enough really applies to this, we used to teach the theory of reading. And the theory of reading is that people do skim scan detail. They skim the title to see if they're interested in it. They scan to see the specific part they want to know. And then they read that part in detail. So always plan your content that way is that's how people are going to read it. The title has got to be really general. The questions um, have to really focus on what they actually are about. And the detailed answer actually has to answer that question, which oddly enough is something that we have to always go back to our content producers and say, even when we get the answers from lawyers, sometimes I hate to admit it, um, but sometimes the content just doesn't answer the question it said mm -hmm. it was going to answer. Um, so make it digestible, make sure it answers what you're going to say, and remember that no one's going to read everything, but the right people are going to read the right stuff. Yeah, great, great points. Yeah, that your internal marketers can take away that both of you guys said is, is probably asking their lawyers those, those questions, have them answer them in the Ted's point of like the importance, I think, of those subheadings and breaking up mm -hmm. the content and then repackaging content and moving around. Sorry, Ted, I Absolutely. interrupted you. No, not at all. And, and I think one thing, uh, you know, uh, Jacob touched upon practice areas. So if you have a website, so one of, uh, we worked with a, a law firm a few years ago, uh, Alexander Holborn uh, here in Vancouver, and uh, they did a really good um, good thing where they 
every practice area, their key practice areas had their own blogs. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the problem that they had was, you know, again, they didn't have Jacob's formula of, okay, we're going to do majority of the writing and then we're Q and A the, the lawyers. They, they did task all the lawyers to write it all so that they didn't have enough content. But the idea of to have a blog or some kind of like regular channel per practice area, um, if you have the time and you're able to do it is, is fantastic. Yeah. So talk to us about that. So one of the things that we always, we always find challenging too, and I think all of us are in the same boat is, is sometimes people come up with really clever titles, but they have no bearing on what the content of the piece is. So talk to us about the importance of, you know, proper titling of your, your blogs and your articles to improve the likelihood that it will be found in search results. So um, I don't know if you guys know the term clickbait. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't, I'm not telling you guys all to make a bunch of clickbait articles, but so I studied media, uh, you know, before uh, starting my business. And um, it's again, understanding your audience and, and taking some of the not great stuff that, you know, Buzzfeed and whatnot are doing, but you can actually make it. So yes, it's a little bit more polished and a bit more um, sophisticated to your audience, but take some of that, like, again, uh, people like snackable content, right? So, uh, you know, top three tips for X, or these are the reasons why you should consider, you know, hiring this kind of a lawyer. This is the, if you ever have a problem with this kind of lawyer, these are the things that you should look out for. That it, it's, you know, it, it sounds kind of clickbait and people will be like, oh, let me at least check that out. And then if you have the subheadings, again, like Jacob said, they will read the first three subheadings and if it's of interest, they'll read that one paragraph that's important to them because maybe they do have that pain when they were, you know, going through like a you know, personal injury case and their lawyer's not doing their thing and you touch upon a particular pain point. Oh, and by the way, in between of all the subheadings, make sure you do have call to actions. Like, is this, don't say it exactly like this, but like, is this you? If so, give us a call. Like you could say it nicer, but ultimately it's that call to action. So they're not just reading the article because with websites these days, it's it's mostly just text, right? So uh, on mobile, so make sure that your your brand's somewhere there. There's a phone number. There's something clickable, um, so that they can, you know, next step. Yeah, um, yeah. Titles are definitely the most important thing. I mean, that's what people are going to see on the Google listing page, and that's really going to determine if they click on it. It honestly has gotten more different difficult to write good titles in the last couple months. Um, because Google will actually rewrite your titles now sometimes, which is a new thing that happened. And many people called it title get title get in, I think it was called because something, um, like, that. something like that, which was which was quite interesting. Uh, so it's important to remember that, yes, regardless of what your title is, Google's going to understand the content. It's really good at analyzing mm -hmm. content uh, paragraph by paragraph. It's really good at understanding the context of the paragraphs and understanding who to show that article to you wanna make sure that the title's informative for an actual person. Uh, so again, to Ted's point, if you have 10 subheadings in there about things people need to consider when getting a family lawyer, there's nothing bad about saying 10 questions to ask your family lawyer, because that's very informative and very direct. Um, you do wanna be uh, clever at some point to make sure it's an interesting, engaging title, but you want it to be informative first and foremost, is this is exactly what you're gonna see if you open this article. And I think that's really, really beneficial um, because again, a lot of people, even the journalists that I work with, they're used to more stylistic writing where they might say something like, guess which bank is getting sued? That doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. What works yeah. is Scotia Bank is getting, I'm not gonna say that just in case yeah. I get in trouble. <laughs> uh, what really works is this bank is, is the name of yeah. the bank in informative direct titles. I, I think also, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, drawing on that too, when we were talking about, so we talked a lot about blogs and practice areas and, and that sort of stuff. Cases is a big one for our B2B clients, right? And so making sure that the, the case name that actually went to trial, if it is a public record, who are the, the parties involved? And then what else, what was the um, subject matter? What happened? What was, is it an m &A? Is it a, you know, somebody was sued for this and that sort of stuff. So making sure they think about that sort of content to optimize too, because a lot of times that's what other lawyers are searching for online is mm -hmm. who tried this case, who were the, who's the firm involved. So making sure that's also in there. Sorry, Ted. Well, I, no, thank you. And, and I was um, wanted to say like another tip that I give, I, I do other webinars as well. Uh, that I host. And, and one of the tips is making sure that you, you keep your eyes and ears open for what's relevant today, like the news and events of today. So um, we worked with a, 
um, family law firm and they do really high net worth um, divorces basically is what their specialty is. And, you know, they were like, we need to get more leads. It was new year, right at the beginning of 2020. And I was kind of thinking, hmm, let me, let me look. And internationally, you know, China, they, they, they got the co- they had COVID first. And I don't know if you guys noticed, but the divorce rates in China skyrocketed, right? Because you're locked down, yeah. you're having to face your significant other all day long. And most people in metropolitan China is like they live in a smaller box than, than in Vancouver and Toronto. So the divorce rates were, were skyrocketing. And, and I kind of was like, maybe we should do some info videos on, you know, child custody things, things about divorce, what you should be looking for. Like, and, and that really, that made their leads jump over 500% right in that span of time. So if there's instances like, I don't know, um, you know, there's there's possibly a player strike for one of the sports leagues, um, if that's something that you work on, or maybe there was like a, a lack megantic type thing or, you know, Evergrande's happening in China right now. Like maybe that 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 kind of stuff is, is what people are looking at. So if you can make an article or some topics quickly on like, don't be the next, you know, real estate investor in something like if Evergrande happens here in, in Canada, like, what do you do? And so those kind of articles be helpful as well. Yeah, there's a great um, for the the people out there who kind of are on a tighter budget with their marketing. Um, maybe many of you know this, but there's a really great free tool uh, for what Ted Simon Google Trends. It pretty much does that. It just tells you like, this is what's going on in the world. This is what people are searching. Um, and it's just good to kind of keep you updated. We actually even though we have other tools, I still start my day when I have to do some content direction to look at this is the practice area. This is what's trending in that practice area right now. Um, and sometimes just to map out spikes that we see throughout the year uh, for different topics. So it will actually yeah. show you that every year, maybe family law in September spikes. There we go. That's a nice thing to keep in mind when we do our next content plan. Uh, so yeah. it's a nice free tool, but agreed, like really helpful to keep on top of, of what's going Google on. Google Trends. Another one, Twitter is, is a good one. What's trending now, that one's a little bit more, you know, to the minute of what's happening. But um, depending on, you know, how big the story is, and you can somehow tie it in, like any good communicator, if you can tie it into your particular business somehow, um, it's going to it's gonna get picked up. Any other tools that you guys would recommend firms invest in or consider? There's um, a lot. Um, <laughs> there's one that I actually recommend that's not actually a tool, um, but it's just a neat feature that Google has, is any question that you put into Google, um, it normally will have a people also mm-hmm. asks this function. And you know, a lot of people ignore that, but that's actually a really great place to start when you're designing content is if people have asked this question, these are some related questions people are also asking. We just use it as a good base. So it's a nice free tool. Um, I don't want to market too many tools, but we do use SEMrush um, and we do use Keyword Tool and we use a couple other ones. But honestly, my absolute favorites, and maybe it's because I'm an old school guy or maybe it's because I just like to keep things simple, are Google Trends, people also ask, and my own Google Analytics and Google mm-hmm. Search Console. Like really, I, I am shocked about how many people um, don't really look at their own website. Mm-hmm. And I think if you're gonna invest in marketing, invest in a really simple platform that lets you understand your own website. So any plan or any platform that works well for you. We actually um, invested in just creating data studio reports, which is basically, mm-hmm. you can see the analytics and see it visualized. And that's really helped get our sales teams and our editorial teams to understand analytics. Because when we did that, suddenly everybody now has access to see like, oh, these are the most popular pages. That's really interesting. Or, oh, this is what people are Googling that gets them to our sites or what we're appearing for. And that's a really powerful thing. And they're free tools, set it up. You're gonna be amazed at just how much power you have by giving your entire team those insights. And at Ballistic Arts, and, and so Jacob talked about all the data stuff. The Ballistic Arts, are our secret sauces is marrying the creative. As you can see, we got this kind of <laughs> crazy thing up here. It's supposed to be smoke. I don't know what it is. One of my designers did it. So like this, the creative piece and data. And so if you're able to marry creative and data, that's going to be the key to your success because you can have all the data in the world, but if your stuff isn't very appealing, because remember, we're a visual uh, society. Mm-hmm. So using a tool like Canva, this is something that I think for those of you who are on the graphic design part or you're part of the marketing team in the firm. It's a very cost-effective, easy tool 
you can actually edit really nice looking um, little graphics. You know, maybe you, again, one of the things that you've taken from a long form content, you took one of the little pieces, you stuck it as an ad, you can stick it in Canva, you can make it on your phone. Like on the bus, you can like start, I don't know if you can ride the bus, but like, you know, you could do that with, with Canva and then you post it. it it's, um, and so my digital marketing specialists, none of them are graphic designers and they use Canva for the quick snackable bits. Um, so that we, our, our graphic design team does more on the bigger stuff, like the infographics and stuff like that. Yeah. If I can just add to that about the graphics, because this is one thing that I see quite often, um, for your whole team, invest in new headshots. As we're getting more and more <laughs> digital, um, and I, I, can't, I can't even speak for myself because my headshot's terrible, but definitely it's good to and, invest in the graphics. And I've actually found that um, in this day and age, because I mean... Um, no one here is wearing a full suit. I guess you're kind of wearing a blazer or something. I'm Just wearing today. a Battlestar Galactica <laughs> t-shirt, right? And then, and and so, but in the age of COVID, so I I have a casual um, headshot now on my LinkedIn. I don't have like the full three-piece suit and all that kind of stuff back in the day. Now, it's going to depend on the culture and the firm and whatnot. But I think people are wanting more approachable these days than they are wanting formal. Um, I've been trying to get the producers from Marketing News Canada to take off my very formal picture and use my casual picture. <laughs> uh, but for my own personal brand, the casual piece is really, I think, um, has helped the company and, and engage with, because I'm more approachable now or something like that. I don't know. So, so we've, we've kind of bounced around. You guys have got a, given a lot of really great advice on, I think, you know, there's so much intertwining between voice search and SEO. I think where does that all sit with your your greater marketing efforts and channels? And I don't know, Ted, if you want to touch on that, like where where should voice and SEO? Yeah, sit? so it, I, I great question, and it it really depends on each client. And so how we we work at Ballistic Arts, we we do for anyone that engages with us, we do something called our our ghost, um, and it's it's not with a it's ghost without an H. So goals, objectives, strategies, and tactics, and the goals. We, we basically, when clients come to us, we want to help them affect their bottom line. What is your ultimate goal that you want to do? Is it 20% growth in this particular practice area? Okay, if so, this, these are the objectives we're going to do. These are the strategies. These are the tactics. And sometimes it'll include SEO. Sometimes it won't. Sometimes it'll include other things. And usually it's like three or four different strategies. And ultimately it is to hit a particular goal and that'll affect the bottom line. Like most of... Um, marketing for the longest time that I can remember is like, we're, we're seen as a cost center, right? Like, oh my God, I have to pay this much for marketing. Oh my God. But what if marketing could turn it on its head and go, well, if you put this much money in, we're going to return this much. And so that's what we've done at our, our agency here. And so it's not so much, okay, you must do these four things. It is, will these things help you get there? And so, and for me, voice search, I think about it as, just like I said, at the very beginning of this call, an extension to, to, to text, right? So if you're, so long as you're starting to think more authentically and how you think how people are going to search you with their hands and their voice, but basically with their brain, it's going to work regardless. Like, cause Jacob said, like Google doesn't care if you're typing it or voice or whatever, it's the fact that you're still searching and that part of it search is the, what's called the middle of the funnel. So there's top of funnel, which is the awareness raising. So if you don't have enough awareness raising, you don't have enough people actually looking for you or that kind of topic, the, the middle is not really going to matter. So you got to focus on that part first. And then when you start getting that groundswell of like all the fish in the barrel, as it were, um, I'm vegan now, so I probably shouldn't say that, um, you know, whatever, I don't know, mangoes in a bag. <laughs> and, you know, then once you got them stuffed, then you, you start, you start picking it, then, then you can do the search, right? That's, that's the most important. Perfect. And so I, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So I'm going to, I'm going to take us back to our, our last two questions. So Jacob, first, what are your top recommendations for generating leads? I feel like you've already touched on this, but, but anything else that you would recommend to, to generate leads online? Yeah, actually I've touched on it a lot. So I'll just get really quick into yeah. it. Um, one, make sure that you've uh, built trust and transparency throughout your entire website every page should have a really clear, easy way to show that people should trust you. So just make sure you have that. Um, number two um, is make sure that there's an easy way to contact you on your website as well, which is a big thing. Uh, I feel like that's, honestly, I feel like a lot of people miss that is that they just don't make it easy to contact you. Um, 
Three is answer those really easy digestible questions that are going to bring people in, invest in content for those questions. Um, if I had to say a fourth one, it would be figure out where you stand right now. Actually, I've talked to a lot of people that don't even realize this, but go into incognito mode, Google yourself and see if you dominate that first page of Google. Because what happens a lot is you might be the third thing people see for your own law firm name. There could be some search engine marketing that has paid ads above you. There could be other stuff, uh, maybe news stories that are talking about your firm that may or may not be positive. You want to make sure that if someone searches for your firm, the entire first page of Google is about your firm or positive stuff about your firm on other sites. Because in the research process, now that we're so digital, it used to be that people might call you up or come into your office. No, the first step people do is Google you if they know who you are. Um, so awareness is definitely the top of the funnel, but when they get to that part where they're gonna search for you, see where you are now and then see where you have to build. And that could mean building more content on your website. That could mean going to a third party to do some content with another site, maybe a news organization. Um, it could be a lot of different things, but take stock of where you are now, I think is really important. Yeah, and for me to, to add to it is, yeah, content is absolutely king. It's always been, um, it's, it's going to continue to be so. We're in the information age, so give good information. Uh, but I'll go back to my point about uh, the user journey. You really want to understand, the, the it takes eight touches before they'll even talk to you at this point. It's not even they'll buy from you. It's, it's like just to consider you. They're going to see an ad. They're going to Google you. They might read a thing. They might follow you on newsletter. So you really want to understand who is the, that key person, that persona, and, and what kind of brands do they look for? Um, and the reason why you want to do that is you can then build lookalike audiences. Or you can even take, um, one thing we didn't talk about is if you have your list of people, your key clients, you can actually upload it to the algorithm, to the platforms, and they'll spit out like the, a very similar group of people for you to then tap into. So if you are able to plan out the journey from top of funnel all the way to bottom of funnel, as well as the loop, the referral loop, right? Digital word of mouth is key, right? Getting people to rate you, all those kinds of things is really going to be helpful, but managing and understanding who that user is throughout the process is going to be key because you can do like 18,000 different things, but maybe it's just these four things that you need to do that are really going to matter. If maybe, you know, Morgan really likes being on, I don't know, Instagram, right? And, 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 and she's your client, then that's where you're focusing. And I think even if, if I can interject, I find sometimes firms forget, and it's a, it should be an obvious first step, but they forget it is that what it, what it, what is the goal? It's not just even who the target the market is, but like, if I want to come up for employment law, Am I talking enough about employment law and doing a real audit of their site and where are the gaps and what content they have, what they're missing, what the steps of that of really sort of, again, what is that goal that they're trying to achieve? Because I think sometimes it's just like, well, I just want more business. Yeah, and, and, and I, and, yeah, I would, I would always say a smart goal too, specific, yeah, measurable, fair. attainable, re relevant, and time-based. So it's like, not like I want more business. I want to mm -hmm. be found on Google for employment law. It's like, I want to increase my um, insurance wrongful practice dismissal. by 25, yeah. wrongful yeah. dismissal yeah. by 25% uh, for these four partners um, by the end of 2022. That is something that, then that's a target that you then you measure, you have to measure and whoever you work with, it be it internally, you have a supplier like um, Jacob or, or myself, make sure that they are talking to you all the time. Not like once a month, oh yeah, here's, it's like, are you changing courses? Are you doing that? And then measure like, is the leads coming in? Did that turn into business? That way, that'll convince partners. And for marketers, you always want more money. So that'll convince partners to, yeah. you know, give you a bigger budget. Yeah. So and if I can take it back, yeah, oh, sorry. Go ahead, no, Jacob, just, before we go to questions. Yeah. No, just to take it back again, because like I said, we, we do work with firms on a daily basis for what we do. To take it back to that plan and to work smart, um, really realize that it is a journey. And I think that's one thing that firms tend to forget Patience. is that, yeah. yeah, if that's your goal, that's great. But you don't just go out on the ice and score a goal. You practice, you train, you develop plays, and all of that's going to come into place. So for every lead that does come in, remember that there's going to be that whole eight point touch journey, eight touch point journey. And so all of these other things that you're investing in are worth it. Like working with other content providers, building up your content plans, looking at um, how you kind of put your content out there, all of that stuff adds up. So really important to understand that for sure.
Perfect. Well, we have one question from the audience, and they were wondering about when you're filtering on Google Trends uh, to limit the the topics you're interested in. Like, how do you wh how, what do you do when you're when you're using Google Trends to help figure out oh. content? Personally, I start big and go small. Um, so normally what I would do is I just start with the practice area that I'm interested in for the day. So I might look up um, mergers and acquisitions as a topic, or I might look up family law as a topic. And then what I do is I look at the related topics, see what's trending, and then start to build out a plan from there, or build out an interest from there. So Google Trends will show you like within that topic, here's kind of what people are interested in. Um, the other way that I might do it is actually when we're looking at long-term plans, is I might put three to four practice areas against each other, see which one has the most, um, see which one is trending the most or which one has the best long-term trend and then build my content plans around that because I know it's gonna be worth more to me and I know it's gonna be a little bit easier to hit. Um, but quite honestly, start big, start general and it's gonna give you some other suggestions and then hone it down from there until you get to something that you feel you can speak to confidently. Perfect. And so how, how should they consider different age groups for voice search? That was a question too. Do, age, how do, do different age groups all use it? What do, we, what do we need to know about that? Well, given my dad still doesn't have a cell phone, um, <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, yes, age group is, is something that you want to consider. But um, that, this is one thing that we do. Sometimes we have clients that come to us and go, we have three different um, segments of, of clients. So we have built three different user personas. Then we'll start creating campaigns and ads and then we'll A-B test. Uh, for the audience that don't know, uh, split testing is like you set out, um, you know, design one and design two and see how the audience reacts to it. Like, in fact, that's how we started our, our branding. This is our, our kind of our new brand. I'm the old guy in the firm and I'm like, there's nothing wrong with our brand. They're like, oh my God. And so so they they created three different looks plus the old look. And then we tested it. We just threw it out there to our audience, um, unbeknownst to them, because every time you look at it, it's a, it's that's the ad. You don't see all four, you see that one. And if they click on it, um, then you're gonna start, you can basically do like a digital focus group. So I would do that with your different age groups because different age, it, it's not end all the, like every age group has a, there's a platform for each age group, right? Like. Facebook, they joke is, is for grandma. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, and then you got TikTok for like my kid and, and Discord and Reddit, right? I don't think, I don't think anyone here is, is on Discord, Reddit or what, like, or need to advertise on that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that there is a need for these people. Uh, there's a platform, there's a place for, for everybody. You just got to make sure that, you know, are you hitting their, your, your specific audience? Um, and I would test it. I would spend a little budget on all three or four different personas that you have and see where it goes. Yeah, and good point about personas too. I think one thing that I've noticed is a lot of times when people ask about age differences, what they're really talking about is job seniority differences. Um, and I think mm -hmm. that's an important thing to build into those personas because yeah, mm -hmm. we're in an age where a 25 year old can definitely be the main decision maker at a company. Mm -hmm. And it's worth it to understand that and understand that that's a lot different than the 55 year old who's the decision maker and how they use voice search and how they use search is going to be 100%. different. Um, yeah. But honestly, I think voice search for any group is becoming more and more popular because even a 50 year old CEO of a company is going to start to realize like, hey, if I can use this to order a sandwich every day maybe I can start to use it for bigger decisions and bigger decisions. Um, Jacob so. just said 50 year old. I'm, I'm like, I'm approaching oh, my sorry. mid 40s. So, so I'm I like, apologize. oh my God, I'm like, <laughs> that's true. Damn. And I am ordering sandwich. Yeah. So think about it. Like if, if, you know, we're kind of coming up, yeah. that means, you know. It, yeah, it anyway. is. It, we looked at um, business to business buyers of professional services and it's almost half now are millennials. And so those are the, the mm. ones who are authorizing the decisions mm -hmm. in a firm are younger and younger. And I think firms are slow to catch up with that. They're still thinking they're going after boomers and, and I'm a Gen X. So like we've just been skipped over, but like the, the millennials are <laughs> really a typical Gen X. Yeah. <laughs> the <laughs> ugly step child. Well, yeah. we, we have, we have a, we work with a law firm right now where they had three or four. Um, I'm not going to say the name three or four, like older gentlemen yeah. that, that were the senior partners. And two of them have, one's exited and another's about to exit. And then there's basically the main dude. And then the, the second uh, managing partner is younger than me, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that change is gonna be pretty quick. 
yeah. right? Because whoever's going to take over the firm is not like five years younger. Whoever's going to start taking the reins is going to be, well, I guess Jacob's the only one. So Jacob's age, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, or maybe Caitlin. I, well, she's not visible right now, but you know what I mean? So, yeah. so start thinking about that Think You got you to gotta think about the future, not think about necessarily just now because content, like Jacob said, it's a long game. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, getting the practice race. So you're going to think about like, if you're future proofing your company, you got to do this now. Yeah. And, oh, sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, when, when it comes to future proofing, realize that the way that people use social platforms now is not the way they're going to use them in five to 10 years or even in two years. Two, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like, honestly, if you look at how Facebook evolves and how the user segments change over Facebook, one thing Twitter. that I'm always, Twitter, huge. One that I'm actually really surprised by, and, and I got kind of called out on this, is because our social team was really focused on uh, TikTok. And I didn't feel like that was really good for us because we're more B2B. But then they showed me what the Toronto Star here did with it. I think it's the Toronto Star, where they basically took a really serious news story, turned it into really bite-sized chunks with someone just explaining it. And if you wanted the full details, you could go. And I was like, well, for B2B and what we do, that works really well. Mm -hmm. I was completely wrong. Someone else found out how to evolve it. And now we really do need to take a look at it. So I think that's the other thing too, is that these things change, dynamics change, and you really got to evaluate every platform that you're using on a very regular basis um, to see if you're really getting the most value for it. Yeah. And the platforms grow with their audience, right? Like mm. when Instagram first came out, it was, you know, young-ish millennials but these young-ish millennials now have mortgages and kids and they're still on instagram but then the younger kids are going to be on right now they're on tiktok but eventually tiktok will mature because their audience mm -hmm. will mature and then they're going to be something else right maybe some ar type social media yeah so i think that's a good, a good place to kind of close out is the fact that i think firms too who who kind of seize these opportunities and start understanding voice search who, who really invest in their seo efforts and the digital marketing and really i think you know as ted and jacob so clearly articulated is, is content 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 they'll really you know round out as the winners in the end even if some of the stuff is emerging the more you can invest in it understand it really dive into what you're your firms and clients are looking for, the better off you'll be and the more you'll position yourselves ahead of, of the competitors. So guys, thank you so much. You guys have provided a lot of really um, great insights, a lot of useful tips and information. And, and we really appreciate your time here and, and everything that you've been so uh, gracious with sharing with our audience. Um, and Jacob, also thank you to, to Key Media for being one of our, our sponsors of this event um, and, and expert and Canadian lawyer. So really great. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. Hi. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, everybody. Well, um, enjoy and happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Yes. Oh, yeah. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. I forgot. It's a long weekend. Enjoy. <laughs> Thanks, Goodbye, guys. everyone All at right. LMA. Have a great weekend. Bye, Bye now.